before I bring on my panelists here, I just want to uh, uh, mention two things about the mid-1990s when the internet was first starting to, to pop in a big way. I was optimistic, and people would ask me, how big is this going to get? And I would try to envision it, and I would say, well, you know, maybe 100 million people might be using this one day. And even as I said it, I would think, this is kind of crazy. I don't know if I really believe this. And, and the lesson of that is that you couldn't have been too optimistic about what was going to happen with the internet. Second point, in 1996, a guy named Bob Metcalf, who was the inventor uh, of Ethernet, uh, was writing a lot of columns talking about an impending internet collapse. And that collapse didn't really happen. Uh, and he had some egg on his face on one hand. On the other hand, he wrote a lot of columns about a lot of the problems that were, turned out to be persistent, persistent challenges in, in the internet. And that really is the focus of our, of our panel today uh, because we're worried now about this thing we have, the internet. There's problems in security, security, privacy, reliability, capacity, and many other things that end with a Y that we should be concerned about. So fortunately, we have a terrific panel. Could you go, uh, come out here, panelists, please, uh, to help us uh, uh, dis discuss this and you know, uh, do a reality check about where we are on the internet. So I'll, I'll um, introduce these uh, fellows as, as, as they come out. Uh, first, to my uh, immediate left, is uh, Paul Sagan. And he's been with uh, Akamai Technologies since uh, 1999, became its CEO in 2005. He had previously been with uh, Time Inc. And he is a, a key person responsible for things like New York One and Roadrunner, which I use every day. <laughs> and he's also a, a, a board member of one of my favorite companies, iRobot. And to his left, uh, we have uh, Pradeep Sindhu, uh, who is a founder of Juniper. Uh, you've already met some uh, Juniper people here. Uh, he founded it in 1996. Uh, and it's a way, really, he figured out a way to dramatically improve the router technology. And he's really one of the great thinkers of uh, internet infrastructure. We're delighted to have uh, Pradeep here. And then to my far left is uh, Tim Wu. Uh, Tim is a professor of law at Columbia University. He's currently on leave as a senior advisor to the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, I should note that he is here not today, as, uh, today not as a government spokesperson, <laughs> but in his professorial role. And he's also the author of a, of a fantastic book called uh, The Master Switch, Thank which I, I recommend to all of you. So please welcome my panelists. <laughs> now we're going to talk a lot about the, the, the challenges, but before we get to that, I just want to spend a little minute on the, the positive side. I've been talking. Uh, to Pradeep a little, you know, and he, he shared some thoughts with me, which I thought were, were, were great, just about the power of, of networking. Uh, Pradeep, do you want to talk a, a little bit about you know, your, your perceptions of, of why networking turns out to be so important, which I think gives an indication of why it's caught on and why we're here, really? Stephen, I, you know, I think I've had a long time to think about why networks are important um, and, and what role they actually uh, can play. It turns out that networks are curious in one respect, that they're very, very important to a lot of different things. But at the same time, people tend to discount them because networks are, in a sense, abstract. Mm -hmm. But what you see is that almost in any system, networks play an integrating role, which turns out to be phenomenally important. And as we discussed yesterday, the power of any system is amplified tremendously by the presence of a rich network. We see this with the internet. Uh, we see this with the human brain, where the capabilities of the human brain uh, are possible only because of some 10 to the 14 connections between the neurons. Um, we see this at, essentially, we see this inside computers that the network inside a computer is what gives it its capability. So we, 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 uh, we don't completely understand the power of networks yet. One day we will. Uh, and mm. when we do, I think we will look back and say that you know, networks occupy a really central place in the development of technology. Right. So, so that's really inspiring. So now let's get to the bad stuff. Uh, <laughs> so even though the internet didn't collapse in 1996, it has scaled remarkably and, and keep adding on more and more uh, you know, it, it, it information, more, more data mo moves on there, more people are using it. Paul, 
why does it, as, as does it keep going? And are we worried now that it still can be overwhelmed? Uh, it keeps going because of this, the power of networks and the power of adding nodes, as long as they don't all go to a central location. Right? There's a big difference between networks that are centrally controlled and those that are distributed. And the internet has had the benefit of being extremely distributed. And so you get more and more power by the growth of the nodes. They don't just become an overwhelming force. So I, I, poor Bob Metcalf's been kicked already at least once a day. I saw him <laughs> for dinner about a week ago, and he still you know, said, I ate my words. We're done with that. Uh, but he's not the only one. If you, obviously, we're not. <laughs> if, if you, obviously, we're not. If, if, if you, if you, know, you go almost every two years, you can find a Finnish researcher a couple years later, a German, um, on and on, a couple more Americans who just keep saying the internet is going to collapse. And of course, it hasn't. We've seen mm -hmm. consistent growth in traffic year over year for 15 or 20 years. We're seeing it move to new places that are stressed, and we need a lot of creativity. But I have no doubt that, there, that it will happen because there are business models behind solving those problems. So I, the concerns to me are not that the network is going to collapse from traffic. There, there are other issues that don't have to do with technical capability. OK, um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to them. But first thing, does the move to the mobile internet then put us in more of a, of a challenging situation? You're nodding, Tim. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Well, I wasn't going to talk about mobile. I wanted to add uh, to the to the um, sentiment that the internet has stood up well a little bit. I, I think there's this persistent tendency to underestimate the internet, even though I mean we say we, we either say these <laughs> either wildly uh, overly positive or wildly over negative. And I think there's been a lot of underestimation of the internet, particularly in technical audiences, uh, going back to about 1964, when um, you know when you when you had the first designs for packet networks and and AT and T. Uh, you know, had a chance to invest in them, and, and in fact, the, the government was interested in investing, and they just said, you know, these decentralized networks are, are never going to work. There's something very deeply counterintuitive about the Internet's design, about this kind of unowned, packetized, best effort, run anything network. It sounds like it probably is not going to work. <laughs> you know, it sort of seems like if it were a bridge, you wouldn't want to walk on it. Would you want to walk on the bridge that's made out of sort of good, solid bell protocols or the one that's built sort of best effort? I don't know. We try and do it. Everything gets there, and maybe it'll get there the other side. I, I think you wouldn't walk across that bridge. But it actually keeps surprising people how well it works. I remember when I was uh, last working in Silicon Valley, well, the, the first time, in the late 90s, early 2000s, everyone was convinced voice over IP was never going to work over the best effort internet. Everyone was saying, you know, we're going to need to deploy the next generation of, I don't know, whatever version of ATM, you know, very fancy equipment. And then the companies that bet against that, like Skype and, and Vonage were two of them, um, you know, Skype half the time is better than cell phone reception now. There's this consistent, and no one thought video would work unless we deployed a whole bunch of stuff and a little bit your, um, the project we were talking about yesterday, Orlando projects type stuff. But, you know, YouTube and, and actually your company have shown that it's not perfect, but it kind of works. And so I just want to say there's been this consistent, almost cognitive problem of thinking the internet is not going to work, and then it surprises people <laughs> over and over. Well, I think the internet, if you take your metaphor, is not a bridge. OK. Right? The bridge <laughs> is a circuit switched yeah. solution. It's you have to show up here and cross my bridge. And the internet says some days you'll take the bridge, and some days there's a big ferry boat, and some days you're going to swim across. And it mm -hmm. finds a path that yeah. works. And it's a completely counterintuitive. But it's weird. It is an article of faith. I mean, the, thing, the fact this network works is based on uh, faith and sort of a lot of goodwill. Because it, it, nobody owns a thing. I, I mean, mean, it's we, like a Tinkerbell pro, uh, procedure. I'm just here. saying, it's a, weird, it's a weird proposition. I, I, I think we're used to it, and we're in this industry. Uh, you know, but it's well, a it's, weird proposition. We're all going to get together. No it, one's going to own the thing. It's a lot more <laughs> than an article of faith, because for networks at this scale, uh, the, the main problem in, the, in building the internet is a problem of scale. Right. And you do not build sen uh, scalable systems in a centralized way. It just doesn't work, hmm. does not work. Uh, and one of the things we've been able to do is for the last uh, uh, 20 years actually double the capacity of the internet every year systematically. Hmm. In fact, for the last 10 years, it's been increasing at a rate of 2.2x every year. So if we're so successful at this, why are we seeing some network providers uh, trying to push us to a role of metering? Our, uh -oh. our internet content there. I mean, uh, that, that, that sort of seems uh, against the grain of what we've been talking about, isn't it? I, I think the challenge that service providers have is that in some cases, their, their uh, the d demand on traffic is increasing very, very rapidly, but the revenues are not keeping up with the uh, investments in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge that they face. 
I'm a little, uh, a little more cynical. Yeah. I think there's a, there's a appropriate market-driven naked grab for profit pool. Now you used to work for Time Warner, Paul. Yeah, and and and. and Profit-seeking company most of the time, mine is as well. I think that's a good thing because it's driving competition. So you have people looking and saying, where are the profit pools? I'd like to have the biggest one. You certainly have stress in wireless networks. One of the irony is the cellular networks are the new networks and they were built wrong, it turns mm -hmm. out, right? They were optimized for voice with proprietary protocols and it turns out people don't want to talk on these devices. They, we want to push data and we'd like to use IP. Right. Mm -hmm. So they've got a lot of work to do to get more scalable to make them work. But that doesn't suggest to me that the internet will collapse or that we just need to have great sympathy and say they're the only people with a problem we need to help them out. They'll evolve that. Stephen, there's one other aspect of the network I think it's important to touch on. Uh, TCP IP is one of a handful of technologies along with general purpose microprocessors and long-term persistent random access storage mm -hmm which we will find a way to increase its power exponentially. Mm -hmm. So this interactive any-to-any -any networking is fundamentally important to anything and everything. Mm -hmm. and, and we will figure out a way to, to scale it exponentially. I'm confident. Well, this is like a faith-based uh, argument we're here having. It's, it is. On many, many important institutions are, are articles of faith. I mean, uh, what, why did, let's take the legal system, something I know about. How does the legal system work? It doesn't work because the policeman actually is going to catch you. Because most of the time, people mostly follow the laws. Mm -hmm. And in countries they don't, they turn into to anarchy. But to answer this particular question about, um, about why uh, there's this so-called uh, desire to go towards metering, um, this is my own view, not the government's view, definitely. But I, I, I'm, I hold with uh, what Paul says. I think that ideally, um, phone companies uh, would like to replicate the conditions on the cell phone networks, where if you're a consumer, you are forced to guess how much you're going to use. And of course, you're always wrong, right? I mean, no one uses, unless you happen to use exactly 1,000 minutes a month, which I don't think, has anyone here ever done that? So either you guess, <laughs> you know, you buy too much, you don't use it. Or you buy too little and you get screwed with the fees, over, overage fees. And so either way, you lose. And, and it's, it's actually a practice that's illegal in other utility uh, markets. For example, the electric companies aren't allowed to say, Guess how many kilowatt hours you're going to use this month. And how are you going to know how many kilowatt hours you're going to use this month? It's an it's a abusive practice, actually, because nobody knows. And then if you're wrong, you end up paying. So it, I, and, and consumers aren't, it puts all the risk on the consumer. So why wouldn't you want, if you're, you know, Bell, it's a great, uh, this is basically a more elaborate version of what Paul's saying. But yeah, why wouldn't you want that system? It has no relation to reality. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and a, because, you know, if you use up, you don't use up, there's not some finite supply of bandwidth a month that you right. run to the end of and it's gone. I mean, you either fill the pipe for a minute or you don't, as, as these guys know. So it, that, that's not the issue. Well, un, un, underlying really the, the, what, what you're saying there is the idea that you know, we have these duopolies, there's a du duopoly in, on one hand and then you know, uh, just a, a very few companies in you know, the, 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 the mobile world there. I'm wondering whether this system, this lack of, of competition there is uh, gonna cap innovation and you know, just put us in trouble in, uh, on, on the longer term. What do you think? I actually don't think so. I think there is sufficient competition in the ecosystem that, that uh, the rate of innovation, we're, what we're seeing is that the rate of innovation is actually accelerating, it's not slowing down. In what area? In the area of devices, in the area I'm, I'm, of, I, okay, uh, uh, in the access part of the mobile network, in the core of the, uh, of the network, in the edge part of the network, no matter which part we look at, we see innovation yeah, happening. Yeah, that's true. So are I you, are you cool with duopoly, Tim? You know, I, I think that, remember I start, opened this conversation by saying the internet had this uh, uneasy birth in the sense that it was always very opposed to by the Bell companies. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the relationship is still a little uneasy, put it that way. I think they've decided, well, maybe this thing is okay, um, and then we have made some money off it, but I think there's still a, a, an uneasy relationship, and what, if I would say one of the long-term threats to the internet, I think it's an abeyance right now, but if you want to talk about a threat, it's always been uh, the access points, and, and uh, particularly, I think, earlier this, this decade, or last decade, um, the idea of, of trying to, to have the, the access point providers decide who are the winners and who are the losers, I think was very dangerous to the internet. I think we've sort of come past that, Mm -hmm. and, and that's, I don't think people are talking about that as much, but the fast lane, slow lane stuff, I think was, was dangerous to the health of the internet. Tim, I, I, yeah. I'd go a little bit further. We, when we uh, discuss with our, our key customers, uh, it's clear now that they're well past the point where they're questioning whether 
IP is actually the technology on which right. all services can be built. I, I, we don't have those discussions anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, eight years ago we used to have them. Yeah. Today it's a generally accepted fact that this network is capable of supporting any application that doesn't violate the laws of physics. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think the the thing that we have to watch out for is in any portion of the innovation, do things get choked off to too few choices? And clearly, access is one sort of a fundamental one. But as we look across. It's been this flowering of m lots of innovation and rapid innovation, and often in unintended or unexpected places that makes it work. So there are lots of reasons, for example, yeah. over-the-top video is working today, including fatter pipes mm -hmm. to most homes. But one thing people don't focus on is the uh, Trojan horse set-top box. Most people didn't say, I want a second set-top box. In fact, nobody really wants mm -hmm. that. But 50 million people connected gaming consoles for a completely different reason. And now over the top long form video works because they have the internet on their big screen called the TV. And there you had a market with lots of innovation and more than three players. And something happened that we didn't even guess was going to happen. And so I think the threat is in any place does innovation come down to too few innovators and access right. is a place to, okay. to worry. Okay. The other aspect of the internet that's worth pointing out, it's the ultimate platform. And ultimate once you, what, sorry? The ultimate platform. Right. And once you create a platform like this, there's room for lots and lots and lots of people to innovate. The iPhone would not have happened without the internet existing. Mm -hmm. uh, new over-the-top applications wouldn't happen without this platform. So uh, there is a lot of innovation going on, I believe. Yeah, okay. I agree. But I, I, I'm going to echo yeah. Paul's idea that um, you know, it's not like you create the platform and it's sort of this you know, it's like they an act come. of God or something. And it's, you know, it's a man-made creature. And it, it, it can be changed. And, it can become, and, and I think what Paul said earlier is right, that the strength, at the very beginning, you said the strength of the internet has always been in its decentralization and its Absolutely. diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are mutable characteristics. That is, they could change, and you pointed out you could have a monopoly on access that could change it if it was unregulated, for example, completely unregulated. Um, and also other parts of the network, if you start to lose diversity, if you just have a single company or, or one, basically one company deciding everything that goes in one area, there is some risk, I think, yes. to the health uh -huh. of the network. So look, let's look at the other side of the coin. Maybe because of the openness of, of, of the internet and some other reasons as well, I'm sure, uh, we face a huge security problem here. Uh, the, lately, we've seen these uh, attacks, anonymous, you know, global, uh, uh, net that, that show that the, the dark side hackers can pretty much break anything at will, whether it's Sony or the CIA, right? And you know, there's um, uh, problems with cyber thieves you know, hitting banks successfully, and there's, uh, you know, God knows what the cyber warriors for big countries are, are, are doing and planning there. Uh, how, how tough is this problem here, and, 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 and what can we do? Uh, the, the people who are attacked basically you know, say, well, you're next, because you know, even though the, they might have been uh, fingered for this vulnerability or that vulnerability, it's, it seems that no one is, is impervious to, the, to these attacks now, and the, the emperor has new clothes when it comes to security. So this problem is fundamental, and it will be there with us forever. So this issue of the trade-off between sharing and security is very old. And any time you build, the, the value of the network is tied up with its openness and its any-to-any -any nature. And along with good packets will go bad packets. Uh, the, the, in an ideal world, you'd keep it completely open and com com completely any-to-any, -any, but the fact is there are bad actors. And so now you have to protect against those. It seems to be getting worse, though. I mean, the, at what point will you know, uh, we be forced, or will we be forced, to take measures to clamp down on, on, on the openness now. If, if no one can be assured that their operations will continue, if the banks can't protect our money, I think the what, change, what do we do? Yeah, the change of state, Stephen, that's happened is that in the past, it used to be people, uh, hackers actually breaking into systems just for bravado. And now you have organized, uh, in some cases, uh, countries, and in some cases, organized groups that are going after money uh, and maybe information. And that's a change of state. But I think. Uh, we will perpetually be in a state where uh, the defenses become more sophisticated and the attackers become more sophisticated, and it's, it's, it's war, essentially. Right, right. Well, and you're on the front lines, Paul. What, what do you say? And it won't end, because it's the old line about you rob banks, because that's where money is, and people have figured that out, so they're going <laughs> to go. This is a techno technology as a tool. It can be used for good or bad, mostly good. Mm -hmm. We see some bad. There are lots of technologies that we now wake up every day with and live with for good or bad, but we don't lose 
endlessly. So nuclear power is one, and both for good and bad. And, and you know, a whole generation woke up every day for a long time thinking the world might end, and, and we got to a point right, where right. fair stability. We're going to the same thing for sure on the internet, and the security model will change. I think what's happened is the attackers, the bad guys, have moved quicker because they saw a chance to profit with their business model, completely mm -hmm. nefarious. And the security model is changing. We're seeing that today. The traditional security model was, was you know, go into your home and build a moat and secure it. Um, it's really not the best place to secure your home. If, if there are bad guys are at the back door already, mm -hmm. you're in trouble. The models are now moving to broadly distributed security. So we saw, you may remember the 4th of July attacks two years ago that took down a number of US federal sites. They didn't take down all of them. The traffic actually all came from one country in Asia. Um, Which in, country would that be? Uh, it emanated from machines in South Korea. It wasn't controlled from there. Right. And for certain sites, in fact, the ones that we protected, federal government sites that didn't go down, all the traffic was stopped there. It never left the frontier, if you will. Mm. So there are new security models that are evolving that can handle some of the new kinds of threats. There is no silver bullet. I absolutely agree with Pradeep. We're not going to end it. But we're just going to have a continuing arms race, and people will learn how to secure things. I do think on the state level, we've moved from this fear of nuclear war, which hasn't gone away, to the fear of, of a cyber war. And that is of a, obviously of a scale that goes beyond business mm. to deal with. And we've seen that well, in a couple of cases already. I'll say one thing. I'll take a cyber war over a nuclear war. <laughs> if that's where we're going, I'm pretty happy, frankly. I mean, I, it's yeah. pretty bad although, to lose my laptop. Although, <laughs> although <laughs> not, it, 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 it sort of depends how it's launched. If it drops yeah, planes out yeah. of the sky, we might not feel yeah. so yeah, good about it. If it melts down it. Indian Point, it gets to be academic to the people who, you know. Were, yeah. yeah, no, I, I, I didn't want to belittle it. But I mean, nuclear yeah. war was a lot worse. A lot um, worse. Yep. I, think, I think, you know, <laughs> another thing which is, I think we're headed towards this, which is that we should not give any safe haven to uh, people who want to do damage. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and here, if we can have a set of laws that are enforced uniformly, that would be of great, great help. Yeah, well, that's a great point. There is no body to do that. So for example, in the case of the July 4th attacks, we knew where the attacks came from. It was almost unenforceable. You couldn't go get them. And by the time you might get even right. there for friendly allies to do it, the bad guys are gone somewhere so else. So we, will we be blacklisting domains or countries you know, in order to? I think we have to use something like that, because otherwise these, these actions will continue. As you may as actually, it's one of the areas where I think, um, and I will speak as a member of the federal government, where it, maybe law would be useful. Yes. You know, I mean, ultimately, no matter how uh, much of a hacker you are, you ultimately have a body. And a body can be, um, I mean, a physical body. And you can be put in prison. And that, that is sort of the ultimate deterrent. And, and I, I think some of it has to do with a certain sense. I think in, in law enforcement, there's a little less priority given to these things. There's some, but not the same. I mean, people are used to sort of going after bank robbers and drug dealers. And hackers sort of seem to, I mean, they talk about them, but it sort of seems like a joke. And you know, they, <laughs> you know, I don't think it has the same kind of seriousness. I know it's in the newspapers, but I think in law enforcement culture, I don't think there's quite, there's a little bit. I mean, there is. It's just but not the same level of resources that there could be for combating this stuff. Well, so maybe I, it is one of the things that is a problem right. for government. Well, I know some, some uh, laws and regulations that are being talked about would be on one hand to build surveillance into the design yeah. of, the, of the internet. Another would be to build copyright protections in deeply you know, w w within the internet there. How does, that, how does uh, the copyright protection uh, prevent, prevent this? Well, I mean, or, or basically um, that have, have laws that basically mandate, you know, the, the, the systems right. and, you know, make, you know, build it on the ISP level, yeah. some, you know, some things to, to protect copyright there. Uh, any enthusiasm for that? Some, something that will really help, actually, is strong authentication mm -hmm. before you get on the network. I think that, that definitely will help. So where you can actually rely on the fact that if packets are coming from if packets say they're coming from here, they actually oh. are coming from so here. So are you, are you suggesting a move away from the anonymous in internet where we almost need a, a equivalent of a cyber driver's license to? Well, we actually, uh, we, we're not operating in an, in an anonymous internet anyway. But, but I think having a, a, a more reliable set of uh, pieces of information where you can rely on this person is the person that uh, he or she uh, says she is. And there's a difference between anonymous and authenticated, because even in an anonymous environment, in fact, it might be more important to say, I know that that handle is really the same person. They could be authenticated and still remain anonymous at some level, and then you could have rules 
in different communities for whether you have to be anonymous, use your real name, but at least know it's the same person behind there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're getting, body you're getting, language is not communicating enthusiasm. Yeah. You're getting closer to cures that are worse than the disease, though, at yeah, some point. Absolutely. And that's what, I, that's what I, I mean, I don't know. It sort of takes all the yeah, fun we need away. The right, but, but here's, here's the thing. Yourself yeah, we should time. use the right tool. We what the hell is the internet a, for? If not, we shouldn't <laughs> use a sledgehammer if we need just a little, a little hammer. But, but here's the thing. I think you can have degrees of anonymity. Uh -huh. And the more anonymous you want to be, uh, the fewer things you'll be able to do. And that's a fair trade-off. Yeah, I, I, I see it. But there is this underlying danger that you know security. People react. Uh, er, people do not react calmly to security threats, uh, obviously. And so it, it is an obvious tendency to go too far and sort of shut down some of what mm. could, is originally good about the internet, which you know might cost us in terms right. of economic growth and stagnation. I mean, everyone. If every site was like a bank site, you know, if you had to get onto Google or Facebook, you had to. Identify that, your cat and three of your yeah. last pets and like your your grandmother's <laughs> sister. I mean, that, forget that it. I mean, it, that's, that's, that would make it unusable. <laughs> done with but, that stuff. I mean, that, you know, you, yeah. You, right. you don't you don't want somebody anonymous to log into your bank account, for example. Right. 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 So, but you know, uh, yeah, what is the role of yeah. government? You know, you 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 mentioned you you opened this up, Tim. Uh, yeah. Some people feel, hey, the internet, leave us alone. You know, we're, we're we'll do fine without. Any government in intervention, any uh, uh, law that, that comes up, there's some right. group that adopts a name, you know, that protect our internet, you know, no matter right. what the law is, whether it's a net neutrality or something else. There, uh, yeah. wh what is the role? How, how activist should the government be right. in protecting or regulating even the internet? Well, I mean, it's a big topic, and it's you know as big a topic as political theory itself. Like, what what should government ever do? Um, I am uh, strong. The tradition in this area is for government, and I mean a hundred year tradition, is for government to be extremely activist in, in communications. Uh, it, it basically um, uh, guaranteed a, a telephone monopoly for most of this century. It, it um, helped out ABC, NBC, CBS, made them the official networks. Um, you know, so there's a strong history of, of heavy government involvement, and I'm generally opposed to that. And I think we've come a long way from the, the, the days where government would decide what the media future was because it was too important for the market. Um, on the other hand, I do think there are particular public values in communications. I, 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 don't, I think that um, news and communications are slightly different than uh, potatoes or neckties or other markets. So they, they have sometimes public-facing considerations that, that might warrant more oversight. So basically what I think government's role is, is to ha particularly have oversight over the problem of monopolization in this area, over the problem of excessive private power, which is cutting down on innovation and, and economic growth. That's my bottom I think, line. I think the second yeah. one is the rule of law. Right. Well, I, I said that earlier. And the other is to, to enforce basic criminal laws against. Well, there, there is still a strain which says that right. it, it's, it's absurd to pursue monopolization on the internet. Things change so quickly. That, right. you know, the, the natural forces, the innovator's dilemma, will overturn the company that, that dominates at, at, at one moment. I don't think any natural forces were going to overturn Microsoft circa 1996, <laughs> personally. And I, and I think that was an important action by the federal government to prevent uh, the, the use of the Explorer browser, then 2001, about 95% mm -hmm. of the market, from, from being used in ways that would have had a big impact on innovation in, in the last decade. So I, I'm not a big interventionist, but I do think um, it, monopolies, how long they last is a really interesting question. And I don't, I mean, you know, sometimes they go away. You look at companies like AOL, well, AOL still is kind of around, but they were really big and went down. But sometimes yeah. they can last decades, uh, you know, decades and decades and have a big effect on, on the market. Yeah, I think he's hit the, the, the right two. And there are some cases where you want a monopoly and the circuit switched world. We wanted one because it was right. much more efficient, so it needed to be regulated. Um, today, that's very different in a packet switched environment. The, the, the concerns of scarcity have moved to another place. So are the kinds of things we're talking about uh, going to be uh, bigger concerns or, or maybe even retardants to our entering the cloud era? What, what impact does our movement to the cloud, which pretty much everyone thinks is inevitable, going to do to these issues that we've been talking about? And after we discuss the cloud for a couple minutes, I want you to start thinking of your questions. And um, uh, if you're on Twitter and, and, and you're following it, uh, sla uh, hash mark ne next work. So the cloud is certainly an area where I think government is tempted to dabble, and it's very early, and that's a little bit scary. 
Right? The, the question what of where is, what examples of so the question of where does data reside and who's responsible for that and who can go get it. If the cloud sort of presumes that everything is virtualized, so you don't know where your data is. Um, governments are about physical regulation. You know, uh -huh. I know my borders and I want to regulate them. Suddenly, if uh, the data doesn't really exist in borders, if a government says it has to, or turns out that data is sitting in some country, and the country says, I'm going to go get that, and they have a different privacy policy. To a corporation or to a user, that's a, a, a scary, potentially large dilemma. And I think countries naturally gravitate towards wanting to secure things in a bordered physical way. And there's a lot of discussion around regulating of cloud, for example, which is pretty early on to try to write those mm. rules. I'm actually very nervous about governments regulating uh, architectures which is in their infancy. Uh, in fact, one of the challenges of uh, cloud is that security becomes a lot more important. Mm -hmm. Now that you don't have physical control of your data, um, as Paul mentioned, the data may be sitting uh, far away, in perhaps in more than one place. Mm -hmm. uh, ensuring its physical security is actually very important and a difficult problem. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it's, I, I think. I agree with the sentiment that government shouldn't regulate early stage industries. And, and as I said, I, I think the most appropriate role is for the government to wait and be nervous about massive concentrations of power, standard oil-like situations, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, where the, the, the market is stagnated, choked up by a single company who has, uh, is, has shows no sign of its appearing. Now, you never know for sure. Mm -hmm. So the cloud, I mean, regulation of the cloud is, is mostly premature. I, I think that in the abstract, no one wants to regulate these things. On the other hand, when you get to a specific issue, they might. For example, I think that many Americans and people around the world do want some oversight of the privacy practices of the main uh, information collectors. Mm -hmm. You know, they, uh, just take one example, Google Buzz was something a lot of people were not, that, that's a cloud event, and you know, they was a very, fairly clear violation of federal privacy law, and I think most people think that when, I mean, there's one thing to say, regulate the cloud. There's another thing to say, well, because it's called a cloud thing, if you violate a very clearly established privacy law, that you're exempt from the law. I don't think that makes any sense. And so I think most Americans do want there to be uh, oversight, at least to the extent of very clear violations of, of, of privacy uh, laws or deceptive practices in particular. You know, you don't tell people what you're doing with their information. You, you, you collect it without them telling it, and you use it in ways that you haven't told them. That, I think most no one, cloud or no cloud, no one wants that. Okay, great. Well, let's open it up to questions here. We'll let the, the, the audience a chance to throw something at our uh, panelists here. Do we have a? There's one question. Okay, wait for the microphone to reach you, please. Ah. Um, Kevin Kelly, Wired. My question is um, about the global implications in terms of the issue of global regulation versus national regulation. So we see a cloud coming. We see the fact that this is a global machine. Um, we have, at least in this country, a resistance to the idea of global government and all the kinds of scary things that that entails. And so is there any appetite for having um, some kind of uh, real reach so that the bad guys in another country, if they move the data, or if we have some understanding that moving something from here to there doesn't really change things. So, so what do you think about that? Is this, is this something that is a first step towards it, or is this an, another utopian? Um, well, I think it is inevitable because the internet is the most complex and, in fact, the first truly global machine, as you, as you mentioned. And it knows no boundaries. And therefore, the laws uh, governing it can't be uh, only local. Yeah. They have to be global. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Um, the path of the law, I don't think, is, uh, follows logic in the way it ought to. Yes, the internet is, is, is global. But Unfortunately. There's, a lot, there's a lot of, um, when you really boil it down, I mean, basically, we still have national governments. The United Nations is not a, really a global government, so we have national governments, and they are uh, staffed by people, and uh, they ha have their um, reactions. I think that the way it is, I don't, I'm not going to say how it should be. I'm going to say how it is, I guess, which is to say there are a few countries that are taking the lead in, in regulating uh, some, some of the, or not regulating certain internet 
issues. And the more th um, internationally or, or domestically. So there's a series of countries that have felt very, that they want to regulate the internet extremely heavily domestically. The big example, of course, is China, which wants to censor the internet. Uh, and then there's uh, the countries like the United States who have a very different set of priorities, which are frankly anti-regulatory. We want other countries not to regulate the internet because it's bad, we don't think it's right, and also it's bad for American business. And we think uh, also sort of violative free speech. So you end up with these different sort of legal regimes and, and ideologies fighting off against each other. In fact, what you have in some ways is a replica in the internet space these days of some of the Cold War dynamics, where we think it should be one way and other countries think it should be other ways. It's not as intense and there's no nuclear weapons, but there's well, definitely there's a worry about a balkanization of the... the yeah, there's a balkanization and a, and a tension between different nations as to how the internet should be. And the United States is still basically home base for TCP, IP, internet should mostly be free uh, kind of thinking. But it's not, there, there's sort of Europe as a much more, more intrusive and then you finally have China and some other countries in Asia which are the most. So there's, there's, it, it's coming like that. And I, I doubt that there'll be sort of so, Tim, here's serious the, treaties or, or there's a little bit, but no like but, but here's one thing, real uh, system cooperation. There's, there's yeah. hope for being optimistic because the value of the internet gets maximized when there's minimum balkanization. And hopefully, you know, the Chinese government will realize that, in fact, for their society to be as innovative as possible requires an open internet. Yeah, but what you run into is the fact that countries traditionally see communications as a state function. You know, I mean, That's the problem. you know, the first thing that the rebels do is take over the radio station. People, most countries see the news, the media as, for, as something that government does and controls, and that Americans do not see things that way. Well, we have PBS, but besides that, <laughs> you know, we, we, that hasn't the been the tradition here. So these traditions run into each other, and there are really fundamental differences. They're not just like, they're more fundamental even than the difference between the Bell Company and Internet people. Yeah. Like these are deep running yeah. ideas as to what, sure. you know, how a nation should communicate. And so I don't think you can sort of solve them very easily. And a follow-up question from Twitter is asking, who moderates the global network? I don't know if there is a who who moderates the, the global yeah. network. There isn't. Yeah. There yeah. isn't. Which, 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 which makes it such a... A, a fascinating problem, which gives the power to the internet, right? Yep. And the power to innovate and come up with new models. In fact, I think because no one does sit in that central position, it's a much more dynamic, but, much but more effective But in, in a sense, the United States needs to be the champion of an open internet because... Uh, well, other countries love to hear that, right? Well, the United they, States they is. I, I mean, I'll speak for the government for a second again. Uh, the, there's a fellow, there, there, the State Department and Hillary Clinton, to her credit, has established an entire unit whose idea is to sort of promote the idea of, a, of an open internet oh. around the world. And I think they're doing a terrific job. There's, mm -hmm. there's a, a series of people who, whose idea is it. But there is resistance, again, because people want to control uh, things. There are areas where uh, countries roughly agree, like in privacy, we sort of roughly agree. The Europeans are stronger oh. about it, but there's some agreement, so there's cooperation. But there's some areas there's very deep disagreement. I'll say one last thing. There's this dangerous problem, however, where sometimes the most restrictive state ends up getting its say. So for example, if Europe has the most restrictive privacy laws, those can become the world's laws for multinationals mm -hmm. in the sense that you know, if, if, let's say, Facebook obeys Europe and Facebook doesn't want to recode for America, then uh, in the same way California sets emission standards for the whole United States, mm -hmm. uh, Europe can often end up setting standards for the whole, whole world. Right. But yes. I guess well, it's the, the, very important for us to be in the debate as a country yeah. and not yes. allow it to go there rapidly. Right, yes. Yeah. So we'll, um, we'll be discussing this a uh, little more uh, this afternoon when Jared Cohen, who worked with uh, Secretary Clinton, is, is, is going to be is speaking up there. And there's, no, there's one question in the back. If you could ask it really quickly, uh, we could get this in before we break. Uh, thanks, Steve. Jack Hittery. On the one hand, the internet has made a massive amount of progress, exponential growth, great. But there are certain parts of the infrastructure of our society that have been very resistant to that. Specifically, the smart grid. There's been this lot of hype for the past five years, millions of articles, I'm sure even in Wired and The Economist, about smart grid. It's coming tomorrow. It's coming yesterday. We're going to wire up every home with a smart meter. We're going to have time of day pricing coming via the internet. We're going to drive appliances to turn on at night, turn off during the day. And yet, for five, six years, all hype, very little reality. Right. Why? Do you blame it just on the utilities? 
Do you guys want to do it and they're <laughs> resisting or is there a deeper reason? I think the deeper reason is that uh, when, when you look at the smart grid, most of the problem is actually at the edge of the network. And the edge of the network or the access part of the network is actually a very difficult problem because you need the devices to be very, very low cost and yet very reliable. And those two things don't really go well with each other. So I agree that there's been a lot of hype there. Uh, in fact, one of the things that the utilities are doing is trying to promote completely different set of standards than uh, the existing standards for networks. And right. this is lunacy if you really want uh, low cost implementations. There's another, cog there's a cognitive problem where people consistently underestimate the cost of the last mile. Yeah. Like over and over and over again, it's happened for history. Over and there's a full graveyard full of companies that have done that, including the guys who are clowning through the sewers with little robots with fiber <laughs> optics. The, you know, the last mile is a graveyard for a huge number of companies, and I think it has also taken the smart grid ideas with it. Yes. Okay, great. Well, fi finally, a note of pessimism. Thank you. Uh, uh, but I want to <laughs> thank our panelists here for keeping the faith. Please give them a, a warm hand.